Hello, today we are going to have a look at the functionality of the G1000 Autopilot in the Cessna C172 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. And to do that we have spawned the aircraft at Santa Barbara Municipal Airport. So you can see there's our yellow aeroplane here on the parking area. We're going to take off runway 27, that's uh, right, runway 25, can't read numbers now apparently. And we're going to fly out over the bay and have an experiment. The, the reason I have taken off, or I'm going to take off from here, is because there are two VORs nearby. So it's a really good area to do um, descriptions of you know, how navigation works with the autopilot in re relation to VOR stations, for example. And you know how you might use waypoints as well. So we're not going to use a flight plan with waypoints today. We're just going to use the VOR beacons. but we're really concentrating on the autopilot modes along the way. So let's go and get in the aeroplane. We'll remove the yokes so we can see what we're doing. And first of all, we turn on the batteries, turn on the avionics, and you can hear a warning. That's because we're depleting the battery without the engine running. So obviously no power is being generated by the engine. We can turn that warning off by clicking the warning button. So you can see there's the, the warnings are here about oil pressure, because the engine isn't running, and low volts. You can go over here and switch on the second screen that's got the moving map on it. And then, first things first, then let's go and get the engine running. So, first thing we're going to need to do is make sure that this knob is pushed in. This is the mixture for the engine. If you pull it all the way back, you are completely starving the engine of fuel. So if you push it all the way in, you're giving the engine a rich mixture of fuel. Down on the floor, you've got the fuel tank that's being selected. Because the Cessna is a high-wing aeroplane, you can leave it in the middle, and both tanks will feed the engine. Okay. If you had a low-wing plane, you have to think about which tank, because the fuel is being pumped up to the engine, but it's gravity-fed in the Cessna, so it has this nice option of just setting it on both and the, the fuel will fall towards the engine from the wings because the fuel is held in the wings. Okay, next thing we need to do to start the engine. So we've already put the mixture in, we've made sure the fuel is on. So we go and turn the key and we'll see what happens. We make sure as well before we start the engine that the parking brake is on, so it's pulled out, which means it's on and and the engine is ticking over so i've turned the volume down on the simulator so you don't so i'm not having to fight with talking over the engine all the time so it's going to be quite quiet so i make no apologies for that so the other thing we're going to do as soon as we have the engine fired up is switch on the beacon lights and we're also going to need the nav lights and the strobe lights for our flight and the pitot heat it's just a standard thing, you switch it on. The pitot tube is this sensor out on the wing that measures the air hitting the aircraft as it moves through the air. And that's what gives us our indicated airspeed. Okay, I think we're pretty much ready to go and taxi round to the runway. So we come off the parking brake, so we release it, so that, that lever goes back in and that shows that the pedals are now freed up. While we're sitting here we can make sure we've got control movement so there's the ailerons. We can't see behind us easily in the Cessna but we can do it here and see there's our elevators, there's our rudder so everything seems to be working correctly. Give everything a stir. Make sure the flaps are working as well so we can move them. See, you see the, the flaps are travelling. So we're going to put the flaps to the first position for takeoff. And now we're going to increase the engine slightly and roll round towards the runway. Did I actually release the parking brake? No, I actually left it on. That was rather clever of me, wasn't it? So there you go, proves the parking brakes work. So we're going to ignore the guy with the tug because they're the most annoying thing in the universe. We're going to the, ignore the van as well that just came and parked up in our way. 
You can press the space bar while you're taxiing, which sits you up in the seat a little bit, which is really helpful. So we're just taxiing over towards runway 25 at Santa Barbara. So in the real world, obviously, you would be following the taxiways religiously and you would be communicating with air traffic control. So you would be holding short before we go to the runway and asking for clearance. And then they would give you permission to line up and then permission to take off. But we're not going to do any of that today. We're just going to pretty much do what we want just to illustrate these autopilot features. It's an enormous runway here. So, holding a small amount of right rudder as the engine increases. Holding the centre line, coming through 40 knots, 50 knots, 60 knots. The aeroplane's trying to get airborne on its own, so we rotate gently and we're up. So we just smoothly climb away on maximum throttle. We can raise the flaps now. You will notice the aircraft is still accelerating. Okay, so what I'm going to do, now we're climbing away, is press the autopilot button. That's the middle marker you just saw. That We won't get into radio navigation today. We're just going to talk about the autopilot. So we're going to go and press the autopilot button over here. And you will immediately notice that three symbols appear on the G1000. Roll, AP and PIT. So this means the autopilot is on if this is there and it's green. Roll means we are in autopilot roll mode and pit means we are in pitch mode. If you are not beyond, I think it's six degrees, pitch or roll, it will hold whatever the attitude was when you pressed the AP button. Okay? So roll and pitch will hold the attitude of the aeroplane. If they are beyond that, they will level the aeroplane out. Okay? So we are now flying along 237 degrees, so we're slowly going out to sea, as you can see here. So if we go and look on the map, we can see that happening. So we deviated slightly off of our course, because the aeroplane was at a slight angle. You can see it just on this display. We're not flying absolutely straight and level. So to make ourselves fly straight and level, we can switch from roll mode over to heading mode. So if I press the heading button, if I did it now, the aeroplane would make a sharp right turn and try to fly all the way around to this little blue marker. So there's a heading knob on the autopilot, so you can move that blue marker and that's your target heading for the autopilot for heading mode. So we can either use the, the roller to move that blue marker or you can press the middle of the, the button and it snaps round to the direction we are travelling. So you can see there's a diagram of a small aeroplane here. So this is our direction of travel, which is 220 degrees at the moment on the, on the compass. So if we press heading, now the plane is turning back towards that blue marker. So if we were to turn this to 240 degrees, you can see a number here that goes with the visual indication. So there's our heading we have dialed in, the target heading, and the autopilot is following it because it's in heading mode. We are still climbing the entire time because vertically we are still in pitch mode. So the plane is still holding that 5 degrees nose up attitude. If we want to stop our ascent we can press the ALT button for altitude hold and it will hold at whatever altitude we were at when we press it. So if we get to say 2500 and press it, famous last words, there we go. I must have missed it with the mouse. So it's now gone for 2,600 because we've climbed a bit more. It rounds when you select it to the nearest 100 feet. 
So there you go. So we're going to 2,600 feet, and you can see the plane is slowly leveling out and accelerating, obviously, because we're not climbing anymore. So we're going to pull the engine back a little bit so we don't get too fast. So this will be a good enough for about 100 knots on the power level I've just selected. So let's go and have a look at the map. We are now flying a dead straight line. Yeah. So we are heading 240 degrees. That may not be our exact track over the ground because of the wind. We can find out what the wind is by going to the primary flight display options and then go to wind. And you've got three options. The first option shows you the lateral wind relative to the airframe of the aircraft. So we've got a seven knot wind. We are being pushed left. If we go for option two, it's showing you the, la the, the direction relative to the airframe and the speed. If you go for option three, we get to know the actual heading of the wind. Or sorry, the, the direction it's coming from. Wind is measured in terms of the direction the wind is coming from. So that's the direction the wind is coming from. That's its direction relative to the aircraft. And it's seven knots. Okay. And you can see it represented in little nav map up here. Okay, and so that's actually blowing us. You can see, if you look closely at the aeroplane, the arrow of our direction of travel is off to the left because we are being blown seven knots this direction. Okay, so if we wanted to turn left back around to travel east, we can just spin the blue marker, or we can hold the left mouse button down on one side of it, and it will begin spinning, and you can see the autopilot is actually following it. So we're just carrying on until we get to 90 degrees, or east. So we're nearly there, and we just roll the mouse wheel to bring it the last few degrees. So the plane will continue turning until it gets to the marker, and then it will level itself out. And there you go. So what's actually going on here? Do you notice there is a, a marker that's moving around? The yellow marker is the attitude of the aircraft. The magenta one, is it magenta or pink? It's difficult to tell on this screen. Is the flight director. And we can switch that on and off. Or we can if the autopilot was off. Um, but the, the flight director is what the autopilot wants to do. Okay, so you've got two actual systems in play. You've got the system that's figuring out what to do to achieve what you have told the autopilot. And you've got the system that is following what to do. So when we give an instruction, the flight director will change, it will move. So if we were to turn to 110 degrees, for example, you can see the flight director is saying bank right and now bank left to level us back out. So by following the flight director, you follow what the aircraft wants to do to achieve the aim. OK. So we're flying along 2,600 feet and 110 degrees, and we can see that happening on the map. If we wanted to control our altitude and go to a different height, there's an altitude knob at the bottom left of the G1000. So we can use the outer ring for thousands of feet and the inner ring for hundreds of feet, and it will control our target altitude. So this is the altitude we are at. This is the target altitude for the autopilot. So we could say we want to go to 3,600 or maybe take 100 off that. So we go to the hundreds ring down to 3,500. So that's our target altitude. And notice nothing has happened yet. We're still flying at the same height. That's because we have not told the autopilot how to get there. So we can do this in two different main ways. There is vertical speed mode and there is flight level change mode. Okay. If we go to vertical speed mode, because this is the easiest to describe, it still hasn't done anything, but the symbology has changed to show VS 0 FPM, feet per minute. And you can see a zero has appeared here. So if we use then use the nose up and nose down buttons, we can increment in 100 feet per minute increments the rate to get to the target altitude. So we can press nose up, one, two, three, for five times we are now climbing at 500 feet a minute until we get to 3500 feet 
so the autopilot will carry on flying uphill at 500 feet a minute until we get to that altitude you will notice because we are climbing the airspeed is bleeding off so we need to increase the throttle if we didn't we could we could very you know um, practically set a climb rate that the aircraft can't do and we could cause the aircraft to stall and fall out of the sky so vertical speed mode is dangerous for that reason so we'll wait until we get to 3000 feet and we'll hit altitude hold which stops us climbing oops it would if I clicked on it in time so notice I said it rounds so even though we had just gone past 3000 by the time I actually clicked it it rounded down and now it's going back down to 3000 feet and we're accelerating again look so we're going to pull the engine back because we don't need to be accelerating anymore we're not climbing so go and have a look on the map and see where we are so should we do another turn so we don't completely disappear off the map we'll do a reciprocal of our course so we're going to spin the heading around by just holding the mouse down on the left side of the heading knob and we'll go for about 300 degrees Okay, so you can see that happening on the map. The aircraft is turning. In this little nav map, if you're doing um, navigation by, you know, with um, vectors, as you might call it, you can actually draw on the map. If you right-click, you can measure distance, and it allows you to draw from the point you right-clicked anywhere on the map. So if you then press the left mouse button down, so we're going a 300 degree track, weren't we? So if we move it, there's 300 degrees there, look. You can see the distance and the direction of the line you have drawn. So 10 miles, 300 degrees. If I press the left mouse button, the line will be drawn and will stay on the map. If I press the right mouse button, it will vanish. So I press left and it stays there. If I want to remove that line, I can right click on the cross on the end of it and remove the measurement if I want to. If I've got lots of lines all over the map, I can go to the map menu and I can remove all ranges, measurements, patterns and holdings. So all of the drawings we have done will vanish. OK, so we're flying along and we're at 3000 feet. Say we wanted to get to 3500 feet so we can roll the hundreds knob on the altitude down here. So we've moved the target altitude to 3500. The better way of climbing to 3,500 feet, the safer way, is the FLC button. That stands for Flight Level Change. If I press it, you will see we're in heading mode, the autopilot is on, and we're in Flight Level Change mode, but nothing has happened yet. What the aircraft is going to do is use the throttle to climb to the altitude. So at the moment we're doing 95 knots, Anything we go faster than 95 knots, or in any amount of power in excess, it will use to lift the nose. So it will use the pitch of the aeroplane to control the speed to hold us at 95 knots. So if I push the throttle all the way forwards, instead of accelerating, it's lifting the nose. Does that make sense? And we can change that speed which has now appeared above the indicated airspeed ribbon by using the nose up nose down buttons so we could actually say well we actually only need to maintain 90 knots for example yeah so we could do it well, we've already got almost to the, the altitude so it's, it's not going to let us meddle with it it's almost there but if you're doing a long climb you could use nose up nose down to change the target speed so you can control your rate of climb by the amount of power you are providing if that makes sense and the the advantage from a safety point of view of doing this is you will never stall the aeroplane doing a flight level change or it's very difficult to make that happen unless you were to keep pressing nose down or sorry no yes nose down to get rid of the or nose up sorry if you kept pressing nose up to get rid of the the speed you could force it that way I guess 
So flight level change is a very safe way of climbing to a given height but you have to be starting at a lower speed than the aircraft is capable of. If you've got no way of accelerating, you've got no way of climbing. Hopefully that makes sense. OK, so we're flying back towards the ILS for runway 7 at Santa Barbara, which is going to give us our next opportunity to look at what the, the aircraft can do. we are going to play with first of all nav mode and then approach mode so for nav mode we are going to tune the nav radio 1 into the frequency for this VOR station of 113.80 so the, we already have this compass rose at the bottom of the display known as the uh, course deviation indicator in VOR mode so if I go back on this button until we're back at the master menu. You'll see CDI in the middle, or the home menu I should say. We can flick the this compass rose between three modes. GPS, VOR1 and VOR2. GPS mode would follow a flight plan, or it would refer to a flight plan if we had programmed one, we haven't. VOR1 will, re will relate to navigation radio 1 which we are going to tune in to a VOR station so 113.80 so to tune a nav radio in there's knobbies up here the focus is on this standby frequency and that's the active frequency next to it so we're going to change the standby frequency to 113.80 by rolling the knob so you've got integers and decimals on the two knobs 113 and we transfer that to standard, uh, sorry, to, sta to active from standby. And you can see this as lit up, and it, the, the arrow is actually gently moving. So, to make sense of what this is showing us, we are going to use the course knob over here. So, the course knob, when we roll it, changes the angle you can see here, which relates to the compass rows, and it also moves the green arrow. Yeah, and you can see a line has now appeared. When that line is in the middle and both of these arrows are on the same side, that is the direction to the VOR station from us right now. So the VOR station at 113.80, and you can see the aircraft knows it's the GVO VOR station. You can see this is already moving. The reason it's moving is because we are moving across the path to the VOR so the angle is always changing so if we were to fly 328 degrees we would go directly towards it yeah if um, this is where it's handy to have the full compass in view if we were to fly about 145 degrees we would fly directly away from it so let's try that we will fly and notice that green arrow rotates with the compass so you don't lose track of where it was pointing which is really handy so we can fly the track directly away at the time we measured it from the VOR station. You can see at, at the moment it isn't actually correct because we're obviously turning and turning away from the point we measured it. So we can carry on doing that and we can correct this. So if we tune this back until the line's in the middle and we could actually go to one side just to make sure and then we need to move the heading to match that line so you can get them to line up so we need to turn a little bit more so 159 degrees so let's test that if we look at this on the map and do a measure measure distance from the VOR station 159 degrees look at that yeah, so this is known as the radial from the VOR station, the 159 degree radio, radial from the VOR station. So notice this is pointing the other way. We can actually tune this the other way round. So if we go and spin the course knob all the way round by holding the left mouse button on one side of it, you will see the arrows change. So the main arrow will be pointing the direction we point it, and the smaller arrow on the inner track, there it goes, is flicked round to point the other way. So 
so what's happening here is this is the direction of the course that we are plotting the smaller arrow is the direction of the VOR beacon yeah so we're saying we are going from the VOR beacon we're not going to it if this small arrow is on the same side as the big arrow it would mean this course is traveling towards the VOR station when it's on the opposite side we are traveling away from the VOR station yeah does that make sense so can we make the airplane do this we just controlled it by hand let's press the nav button and see what happens it's only got to make a small adjustment so you can ignore the heading marker on the compass now the airplane is going to align that green arrow all on its own where this gets really interesting and we're going to zoom out slightly so we can see this happen say we didn't want to be following that radial away from the VOR beacon say we wanted a different one we're going to measure the distance again at a different angle so say we wanted the 180 uh, one, I'm just trying to get a nice angle, 170 degrees magnetic angle away from there. Let's change our course and see what happens. So the course knob is here, we're going to change it to 170. So what this is saying is this is the direction we eventually want to be going but we are to the left of the line. So think in terms of us, we are to the left of the line. So the aeroplane is following an intersection course to meet the line and then it will straighten back up at 170 degrees from the VOR. Yeah, so we'll let it do that and then we'll turn round and go back in to the VOR just to absolutely confirm how this is all working. So while it's doing that we'll draw another line, measure distance from actually we'll do it from from over here from somewhere else because we're going to draw a line to it so we get the right angle so we can explain it measure distance from here to the VOR station so that's a good one eight degrees so the aircraft at the moment is flying back towards the 170 degree radial from the VOR station and you can see the green line is getting closer because we are getting closer to the line when it gets to it, the aeroplane will turn left to go the course we wanted to be going. Yeah, so we, the course is the direction from or to the VOR. That's how you have to think about it. So in a moment, we are going to change our course to 8 degrees to the VOR and see what happens. And the aeroplane will fly over and fly back towards it. Yeah, so the aeroplane now is going to turn left any moment. There it goes. It's rolling left and it's going to land on that line. So you can be extremely accurate about navigating between VOR stations by flying the radials from and to the stations and the autopilot does it for you. Okay. So now we're going to tell the autopilot, actually, we want to be flying to the 8 degree radial. So we're going to roll this around until it gets to 8 degrees. And you'll notice that the arrow will flip over in the middle of the, the green arrow. There it goes. And we keep rolling. Keep rolling and we will eventually get to 8 degrees. I'm doing this just as a, a kind of a classroom exercise really. I mean you would never do these kind of maneuvers in the real world but it illustrates the idea of what's going on. So we've got now a course of 8 degrees. Notice it says we are to the right of the line. Yeah and we are going to the VOR station. So we are to the right of the line. Yeah, it, relative to that line, we are to the right of it. So that's what this means. Okay, have I switched the autopilot? The autopilot's still on. Have I broken it? This is having a fit, isn't it? 
It's stuck. Have we found a bug in the simulator? Let's go and press nav again. Oh, we'd gone into roll mode. I hadn't noticed that had happened. That just tells you about paying attention. We had actually gone into roll mode. I'm not qu quite sure what caused it. So I've pressed VO I've pressed nav again, which has switched it back to VOR mode. So it's following the VOR. So there you go. Problem solving is one of the things you will encounter a lot flying airplanes and yeah, you have to be on your toes sometimes and you can see there I I failed. I wasn't paying attention of what mode the autopilot was in. So we've gone back to VOR mode. It will level out. Here we go. And it's going to intersect the 8 degree line. I've drawn a very pretty diagram now. So obviously it's going to take some time to do that, so we're not going to wait all day for it. Okay. So hopefully that's illustrated how you can use the VOR stations with the autopilot. Something that's not as obvious is there are two nav radios. That's why you can have two VORs on here. Also, something that's not obvious at all either, in the PFD you can show different bearings for the different VORs that you might have tuned into. So if I've, do, I've used DME here to do that. If I flick that round again, Sorry, I used the bearing button, which shows you that. So you can f you can show the bearing for nav one, for nav two, and for the GPS, and ADF. ADF isn't used anymore; it's automatic direction finder. There are very few stations around that exist. So DME is the next thing to look at on this um, screen. So to get to that, when you're looking at this on its kind of home screen, there's a PFD menu the primary flight display menu so you saw wind earlier we could control that we can also shoot show DME which is distance measuring equipment so based on nav 1 we can see we are 13.7 miles from the VOR station so if you were drawing this on a map you could actually you know look at the scale and figure out where you are from the the VOR station if you didn't have DME operating, because not all stations have it, you could use two different VORs, tune them in, and that's where having VOR 1 and 2 in play can help. And you could find the direction of both of them and obviously cross-reference to put a mark on the map of where you are. But DME tells you the distance of the VOR station you have tuned into. So you will notice there are two of them up here. To be able to tune either nav 1 or nav 2, you press the center of the nav knob. So if I press it, the focus changes. Yeah, and press it again, it switches back again. So that's how you switch between one or another. So let's go and tune the other one in, just for argument's sake. 114.90. So if we switch over to the second nav radio, 114.90. So that's the standby frequency we press this button to switch it to active so there we go so it doesn't make m much difference to us here but if we switch the CDI over to nav 2 the autopilot will start following it that's why it's important that we know about the bearing mode so we can show 11.2 miles to GVO on nav 1 and nav 2 21.5 miles to RZS. Okay, so you get to play games with, with doing both. If you did want to do some navigation between the VORs, because you can see we're nice and stable flying there, we're about to turn right by the look of it. We're still in VOR mode, we're following VOR1. Why are we not turning? Oh, we're just coming up to the, the line for 8 degrees. So there we go, we're turning right. So as soon as we've stabilised, we'll illustrate something else. Oh, we've actually not quite drawn our line correctly then. But it's, it's, it's giving you the idea of how it works. What we're going to do is flick over to VOR2. So we could say we want to follow measure distance from here. We want the, the course, which is 57 degrees, to VOR2. 
So if we come back out to here, we can press CDI, and it's now following VOR2. We want the course to be 57. Yeah, so the plane is chasing 57 degrees into VOR2. It was almost there, look, because we measured it based on where we were on the map. So it's just basically levelling out. So we're now chasing that 57 degree line into the radio mast we have tuned onto nav radio number two. So this is all, there is a master plan behind all of this. I'm now going to change uh, nav one to be the ILS frequency of 110.30. So let's go and switch back and change nav 1 to 110.30 for this green triangle, which is the ILS feather on the map. 110.30. So we can change the integers with the big knob. 113. Point, uh, so 110.30. So that's the standby frequency changed, and we switch it to active. OK. So at this point, we want to stop following that and just fly along level because we want to switch the autopilot over or switch the um, this over. So we'll go back to heading mode. Before we do so, remember, we're going to need to move the marker. So we press heading, going the same direction we are, and we press HDG. We're now in heading mode and we're following the marker. Okay. So now we can change the CDI back to notice it doesn't say VOR1 anymore it says lock one it knows it's ILS it's a localizer so let's just remove that line we drew earlier and let's remove all these squiggly lines that are following the track in fact we'll go to map and we'll remove all ranges measurements patterns and holdings so we've tidied it up you can see this is now representing the center line of the runway. The course knob doesn't work anymore if you're in localizer mode. So you have tuned the nav radio into the ILS frequency of the runway. You can see we are passing over the center line of the runway. We just happen to be about 12 miles out. So if we were to press nav, the plane will line itself up automatically with the center line of the runway because we are following the ILS beacon. The plane will not descend towards the runway. Yeah? And you will see there's a new piece of symbology has come up to do with the ILS, and that's the glide slope. So this is the vertical position in the sky. So we are going to descend using vertical speed, just briefly. And we're going to say we want to go down to 2,000 feet we want to do it at a vertical speed of nose down a thousand feet a minute and we're going to cut the engine otherwise we're going to overspeed the airframe and you can see this green arrow is coming back towards us we're going to descend even more steeply 1500 feet a minute and we're going to cut the engine back to idle. So we're gliding quite steeply down. And this green diamond is coming up the glide slope. This is a marker that represents where we are in relation to the perfect angle into the apron of the runway. At the moment, we are above it. So if you imagine looking out ahead of us, you can see the runway out there. There's a line through the sky that extends from the ground out towards us, and we are slightly above it. We're about to pass through that invisible line. When this green diamond is in the middle, we are on the line. Yeah, so we're on it now. But we've now gone below it. Yeah? So if we were to press altitude hold, oh, we've actually got to 2,000 feet already. So if we go down for 1,000 feet and carry on our descent, so vertical speed, there we go again. It's diving again. So we're trying to get below the glide slope, just to illustrate something else. So we'll do a altitude hold at that height, and we open the engine back up to fly us along. Okay, so we're flying along towards the runway, 
and notice the autopilot is correcting for side slip with the wind itself we're actually aiming slightly this way because the wind is pushing us if we look at the marker four knots from the left so we're being pushed this way so the, aut the autopilot is automatically aiming the plane that way to put us exactly on the center line so if we look down there at the runway we're dead on okay so we are above the glide slope again I'm going to take over manual control for a moment because I want to illustrate something. So we turn the autopilot off and it starts flashing to, to warn us that it's been switched off. Okay, so we're going to turn and you will see the marker move away from the middle. We're off to the left of the glide slope now. So I'm going to fly the rest of this route manually so you can see everything happen and I can illustrate the changes happening. So we're flying exactly away from the runway, but we are off to the right of the centre line. Yeah, so we're away from the runway and we're to the right. The plane is starting to move on its own. We are above the position for the glide slope. But if you think about it, even though we're flying fairly level, it's saying we're getting closer to the position in the sky. So if we look from outside, if you imagine there's a line extending in the sky, we're flying straight and level, but that line gets higher the further away you get. Therefore, that green diamond's coming back up towards the middle, which is the whole thing I wanted to illustrate. So we fly further away, we get back towards that green diamond. I'm going to descend as well. So we're now below the glide slope. Yeah, so can you see that happening there? So we're going to turn around. You can see the flight director wants us to follow it. So you can fly the plane by following the flight director to do what is reflected on the instruments. The FD button turns it on and off if you're not in autopilot. So if the autopilot is off, you can actually turn the flight director off and it disappears. If you turn it back on, it comes back on again. So there we go, we're flying back towards the runway. We're below the glide slope. Yeah? If I press approach mode now and turn the autopilot back on, is it going to let me? There we go. It's saying GS. As soon as I clicked approach mode, it, so it showed GS. So the plane is automatically intersecting the center line it's also centered the glide slope so it's going to follow the line down it's descending gently you can see the airfield coming around there's the airfield the airplane is following that invisible line through the sky down to the the apron of the runway the glide slope yeah so you can see it's carried on below our target altitude because we are in glide slope or approach mode switches on the, the glide slope symbol so we are following the glide slope so not only is the plane following our lateral position you know over the ground it's following the vertical position down towards the runway now it will not do auto land the Cessna is not clever enough to do that the big uh, planes like the Airbus can do it if you have the fly-by-wire mod for the Airbus A320 in flight simulator if you switch on both autopilots, it's called dual mode, if the, if the ground station, if the ILS supports it, you can have dual mode and that enables auto land, where the plane will actually flare the nose out for you. So, let's go and switch off autopilot and fly this last bit in ourselves, just to have a bit of fun. So you can see if I go nose up, watch the glide slope, it dips away. If I dive, it comes flying up above. So we are now below the glide slope. And now we are on the glide slope. And now we are above the glide slope. If we go left, the green line will move across the compass rows, meaning the centre line is to the right of us. And you can see that. And the reason for all of this is what if we couldn't see the runway? What if we're in cloud or fog? 
we could land without being able to see the runway as long as we know what those instruments mean and we can make sense of our direction. So with the combination of the compass and the instruments you can land without being able to see the ground completely safely. So then we're going to come off the throttle now. So we're now slowing down enough so the aircraft so I can extend the flaps basically so I've come back to idle the white area on the indicated airspeed ribbon is the safe region for flap deployment so there goes the flaps this is a massive runway so I don't really need to worry about slowing down too much So again, we are we are above the glide slope, look, so we can come back down onto it, and there we go. So that's about the the right place. So you can use it to descend in a controlled manner. And the ILS will try to get you to put your wheels on the runway at the point where the large white markers are. Yeah, I'm deviating a bit from it because I'm busy talking and not really looking at things and concentrating. Obviously, in the real world, you would be scanning the instruments at very high speed and doing it all perfectly, but I'm not. Okay, so we're down. You have to excuse my steering skills. I'm learning a new joystick and I'm having to learn to operate it left-handed. So then we're going to come off the runway, flaps up. So there we go, we've had a really good look at the various different modes of the autopilot in the G1000 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Um, there's obviously a lot more to it in terms of actually flight planning as well, but that's another whole story. I've already done videos about flight planning. So if you want to go and look in my YouTube channel, go and search for flight plans with the G1000 and you'll see me explaining how you can program them inside the aircraft you don't have to do them in the main menu of Flight Simulator. So if you're flying along and you decide you actually want to change the plan, you can. Okay, I've also done some other videos where we look through you know, a lot of these menu options down the bottom, things I didn't look at today. So let's just quietly go and park this up. Should we have a look on the outside view? Okay, cut the fuel and goodbye engine. Obviously we're getting warnings immediately because the power is now being pulled from the battery. So we can go and turn off the lights, turn off the pitot heat, turn off the avionics, turn off the master battery and we're good to go. Okay, so hopefully that was instructive and hopefully some of the buttons in the autopilot um, makes some sense. There's one button we haven't used and that's because I can't find an airstrip that supports it. There is a button here called BC. It means back course. So if you imagine, if we go and look at the flight plan here, we flew in along the ILS and ILS is on runway 7. What if we wanted to land on runway 25? Using the back course button, and this is the key thing, if the airfield supports it, you can press the back course button and use the ILS for runway 7 to land on runway 25. It reverses it. But the airfield needs to support it, and there are very few airfields that do support it. So when you press the back course button, BC appears on the, the top of the G1000. Now, I couldn't demonstrate it because not many airfields support it, and I couldn't find one easily. I even did a Google search looking for airfields that support back course and couldn't find any kind of helpful listings of them. So there you go anyway. That's the G1000 in the C172 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. If you like the videos I'm recording, do click the like button in YouTube and subscribe to the channel because it all helps me know that people are actually seeing these things. So And leave a comment if you liked it as well. 
and any comments for more videos let me know let me know what you want to learn about and i'll go and record something okay i'm going to stop there